Welcome to CETV on Cloud On Air, live webinars from Google Cloud. We are hosting webinars every Tuesday. My name is Jay Smith, and today I'll be talking to Gwen Shapiro from Confluent. How are you doing today? Fantastic being with you. Yep. So I want to make sure you all know that you can ask questions on our platform, and we have Googlers on, by to, or on standby to answer them, <laughs> and we might answer some of them later on. Uh, now, let's get started. Uh, actually, I had the pleasure of meeting Gwen a few times, uh, and she was at uh, Strata New York City, and got to see some interesting stuff. She's the kind of the guru here about Kafka. That was a fun event. I hope you also enjoyed it. I did. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's get a little bit of your background. Yeah, so I work for Confluent. It's a company that was started by the people who first created Apache Kafka. Mm -hmm. And we do all Kafka all the time, from support to building a lot of tools that make it mm. easier to run, to running it ourselves on Confluent Cloud, among others on Google Cloud. So. That's great. Yeah, so basically I want to be here today to kind of talk to you about Kafka and how people use it and what's going on there. Awesome. Well, let's get right to it then. Yeah, so I was thinking of starting with just kind of a simple stream processing example, kind of to explain what we're talking about when we say that Apache Kafka is really a streaming platform. And then kind of do a quick intro to just the concepts of Kafka and the components around it. Show two, maybe even three, cool use cases. And then jump into a demo and show you how I implement those use cases. I got a really cool demo for you. Excellent. I like cool <laughs> demos. So do our viewers. So basically, we say that Kafka is a streaming platform. What does it actually mean? It means that you can produce events. Kafka will store them as an ordered stream of events. It will maintain this order. And then you can consume those events, and you can even consume them, do stuff to them, and write them back to Kafka, which is what we call stream processing. Mm -hmm. So just to show you what stream processing could look like, imagine uh, someone trying to being a credit card processor. So you get all, a lot of authorization attempts from credit cards every day, like thousands and thousands every second. A tiny percentage of them would be incredibly suspicious. So mm. we need to detect those suspicious events and separate them from the good events and basically have someone investigate them a bit more, right? right? And it sounds like it could be very complicated. To be honest, doing it in real life is pretty complicated. But it can start with something incredibly simple. If someone is trying to repeatedly authorize the same card over and over again, it's probably very suspicious. Mm -hmm. So we want to basically filter the stream of authorization attempts for this kind of behavior and create a new stream of things that may possibly be wrong. And we want to do it every time an event happens. We want to do it continuously. That's the core of stream processing, not just once a day, because by then the bad guys may be already all the way back to somewhere, and who knows, we, we may never catch them again. Right. So we want to continuously process it. And as you can see, using KSQL is like the simplest way to do stream processing, even if you know almost nothing about uh, streams or Java. Right, this looks very similar to your standard SQL, maybe a few little differences. Exactly. But. So just to show you how it works, we basically say, okay, we're doing a, creating a new stream of possible frauds based on an existing stream of authorization attempts. And the way we select possible fraud is that we look at five minute windows, so we cut down the stream into five minute windows, uh, pick the card number, mm -hmm. and count the authorization attempts of the, this card in this window, and then say everything with more than three in a five minute window it looks like a suspicious card, and we're writing it into possible fraud, and then we have an st ongoing stream of things that look suspicious, now we want to basically send it somewhere else for deeper analysis where maybe a qualified human can do extra investigation. So really the core idea of streaming is that you don't process events once in a while, you process them as they're going on in real time. That's really, if you learn nothing else about stream processing, that is the concept you have to remember. So how do we do it? So let's look at really the components that make up this platform. And the core component is the Kafka brokers, or what we also call a log or a distributed log. Mm. Uh, there is a famous book by my CEO, Jay Krebs, called I Love Logs, where he basically explains that log is the fundamental data structure of yep. all modern computing. And it turns out that logs are incredibly simple. 
It is a data structure where you write things at the end and you store the structure in order for a set amount of time, which could be forever. Some people do like hundreds of years amount of time. And you can see that this could be your application log. This can be a click stream. This can be a credit card authorization attempt. The, it's a message is so generic. Like an event is anything that has happened right. could be it. And so you keep writing events at the end, and then different applications want to read it. And the idea is that every application is independent, and they start at some point, usually at the beginning, and they continue in one direction, hopefully to the end. And there is one direction of movement, which makes it just efficient on disks and okay. this kind of stuff. And also, each one of those consumers only needs to know, OK, I, the last message I got is message 5. The next one is going to be message 6. Let me ping the broker and say, can I get a message 6? Can I get message 7? Right. It's actually a bit, you get a bit more than just the next message, but that's the idea, which means that the client and the broker don't need to keep track of every single event and did everyone consume it and who was supposed to consume it. Right. This is one of the things that were always a bit uh, more computationally intensive and memory intensive in old message buses and really set Kafka apart. Right. So since it's all in order, it's easier to keep track of. Yes, exactly. You just have to remember one number per consumer. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people ask me, how many consumers can I have with Kafka? And I know 2,000. 50,000, <laughs> it's just one number. How mm -hmm. much does a long take, right? Exactly. <laughs> and then I just showed you one log, which in right. Kafka terms is one partition. A Kafka topic is made up of a lot of partitions. And then a topic is kind of this logical entity, maybe like a database table. And then Kafka mm -hmm. is made up of a lot of those topics. Um, we're, I'm going to show you a lot of topics when I, we do the demo. Uh, but that's the idea is that the topic will have many partitions. You can spread them across many machines. You have many producers writing to them, many consumers reading. So it's really a scalable system. The other thing is that each partition is also replicated, usually on three machines. So you have a leader. All reads and writes go to the leader. And then the followers basically keep replicating things. As you have one job, keep replicating. And if something happens to the leader, basically one of the replicas take over. The idea is that because all reads and writes happen to leader, we always have full consistency on that partition, which is really a core guarantee that Kafka has. That's good, yeah. I mean, if you have all of those events and one of the machines goes down, heaven forbid, you want to make sure you can maintain those events. So having this replica technology built exactly. into in exactly. Kafka. Exactly. And usually when things go wrong is because people misconfigure replication and think they have guarantees that they actually don't. So you can see here that it's kind of really scalable end to end from producers through partitions to consumers. And consumers really have the idea of consumer group. So if one consumer instance cannot mm -hmm. handle all the data from all the partitions because you know thousands of credit cards per second is a lot of work. You can actually uh, start multiple instances that belong to the same consumer group. And right. they will basically negotiate with each other and say, OK, this one is reading this partition. The other one is reading the other partition. And you get scalability on the consumer applications and also high availability. If one of those crashes, basically the partitions will get reassigned to someone else. So it's really scalable and resilient end to end. And then if you go to the Apache Kafka project, you will only really get clients in two languages, the Java and Scala. But Kafka has a binary protocol that is only slightly complex. Uh, so a lot of people started implementing this binary protocol in different languages. So you have a pretty big ecosystem in all those different languages. And then if your language is not supported, you have a REST proxy that will uh, give you support. Pretty much everyone does REST, right? Exactly. And that's great because a lot of times when you want to learn a new tool, there's a, a limitation based on whatever software or whatever uh, language it supports. But being able to support a wide array of languages, I can just take whatever knowledge I have today, mm -hmm. take advantage exactly. of the, 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 the REST proxy. Do you notice that we're expected to learn new languages faster than we did in the past? Oh, yeah. There's like three <laughs> new ones every month or I, something. I know. So I spent most of my career with Java. And then suddenly it's like, oh, I have to learn Go. And mm -hmm. now I was told that Rust is a really big deal. And Kotlin is a really big, like, everything keeps happening. So 
And it's funny, I have a friend who's now learning Rust, and he's like, do you think I can just write a Kafka producer as my first project? And I'm like, go for it, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe he'll write one in Julia, too, now. Ooh, maybe if you have spare time, I don't know, do you do hack projects and that kind of thing? Sure, why not? Yeah, 20% time, right? That's the... So, until now, I kind of explained how you produce and consume events from your applications mm -hmm. that you coded yourself. But there is a lot of cases where the data you want is not something that you actually create yourself. It actually right. already exists in some database, and you can't really ask the person writing to the database to please also write to Kafka because they have their own priorities. Well, you can really connect to the database and get events to Kafka with the Connect framework. I mean, you mm -hmm. could write it yourself in your own app, but there is so much in common between all those different poll and produce loops that we figured that we may well give you the framework and let you focus on how to query the other database. So it's a very basic idea. You get data from a database into Kafka or from Kafka into a database. You don't have to do the entire flow. Just uh, one, half of it is fine. But in the demo, I'll show you the entire flow. And obviously, once you write a good API, Communities are kind of amazing. So mm -hmm. hundreds of connectors showed up right. from all those different teams and companies. Like the Google, the big connector from Kafka to Google BigQuery was written by a company called WePay, and they just open sourced it. And now, like 10 other companies also use it because apparently getting data from Kafka to BigQuery is a very big deal. Right. Yeah. Apache mm -hmm. Kafka, I mean, we must em emphasize the fact that it is open source. It is. Mm -hmm. Very community driven. Confluent is very active in that community. So you do get a lot of these third party connectors and tools built for it due to its open source nature. Exactly. Exactly. And for me, it's just always amazing the creativity of the community. Did you ever want to get events from a Bloomberg terminal into an IRC channel, for example? <laughs> and then the last component is really doing the stream processing. And I kind of already showed you how it works in the beginning, so I don't have to go over that again. Right. But I wanted to mention that this is kind of friendly SQL, but it's a layer on top of a Java API and a Scala API that you can really use more directly if you prefer mm -hmm. using Java and Scala, which a lot of us really do. And it does give you a bit more power and flexibility at the expense of slightly more complexity, which seems like the usual uh -huh. trade-off in pretty much everything. Right, yeah, being able to uh, essentially query the stream so as it's writing to the logs, you're able to get information, not actually just waiting until it actually is exactly. written. And I'll show you that on screen in real time, like just type a query and see the events come in. It's pretty awesome. And... Um, yeah, and this is like six lines of code or so, and it's six lines because we broke it up. Uh, I wrote the same thing in Java, and you know, it, was, it wasn't huge amounts of code, but it was definitely three screenfuls of lines mm -hmm. written. So having the ability to really do it quickly is pretty big for busy developers. So what can we do with this? Like, our listeners at home may want to go and write their own stream processing framework. What's it, what can they do? So one thing that we see very often is how companies have those clicks of events that are actually meaningful information that they want to analyze, sometimes from web applications or mobile apps. And then they may want to enrich the event with things that they know about the users, so some data profiles that come from a database query, maybe even log files to mm -hmm. see if there's correlation with different errors that happened. And you can really bring all of those into Kafka, probably into different topics, Use KSQL to join, window, aggregate, do whatever you want. And then you can really stream the events into external systems like Google BigQuery right. so you can do more analytical work. And that's one thing to emphasize. KSQL is fantastic for kind of data managing, joining, uh, grouping, and it works really nicely in real time. But it's not like, please query the last five years of data right. uh, kind of thing. And, there is a lot of stuff right. that really you want to write the data to an external system so you can do a lot more involved analytical work. Right, so you wouldn't necessarily try to train a model with KSQL, just I more, can't like, imagine. <laughs> more like getting the information that you need to train exactly. the model. Exactly, and you know, before you train a model, you really need clean, high quality data. Right. This is where we see the connectors and KSQL really come in. 
But the big question is, how do we actually do it? How do we get data from Kafka to BigQuery? And it's one of the things that I had my own opinion, and I thought it's obvious. And then I asked other people, and they had their opinion, and they thought it's obvious. Uh, so I want to go through some options. So the old school way is to do something called SECOR, which is a ba basically a batch job, highly okay. parallelized batch job. So think of it as a big map reduce job. And it basically goes, connects to Kafka, starts consuming events, and writes them to BigQuery in parallel. But this is a batch job, so it will run once an hour or so. Mm -hmm. And while it's pretty cool and it's flexible and it does all kind of cool things, uh, we did a lot of work to make sure we get the data in real time. We don't want to lose the real time aspect just before we land in BigQuery. So we also picked up a bunch of streaming options. And you can use stream processing frameworks. And I gave as examples Kafka Streams and Apache Beam and obviously uh, Google Dataflow. And this is being pro full fledged programming languages, it gives you a lot of control over what your data is going to look like. So if you need to do a lot of standardization, a lot of cleanup, get some data over here, some data over there, a bunch of filtering, you can really write those jobs and do basically get events, clean them up, write them to BigQuery. And of course, it's programming, so you have to actually write all of it yourself, all the error handling, mm -hmm. all the, the schema handling, all those is your own code. Uh, Kafka Connect is pretty much the polar opposite. It is still streaming, but it's basically a no-code option. You give it, I'll show you, basically write a big configuration file, and you uh, say, okay, I'm getting data from this topic to this uh, BigQuery data set into that table, and you expect mm -hmm. Kafka Connect to handle everything for you, more or less. So you, it's kind of like if this does our job, you're done in five minutes while writing code can take a big testing cycle. And if you actually need the control, then, I mean, it would be nice if I could do it in five minutes, but I can't, so. Right, so it's great for getting started, you know. It's uh, amazing for getting started. I'll show you how quickly you can get shit done. It's, um, I'm thinking that these days, engineering is under a lot of stress to deliver things in very short time cycle. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times like you have to show results before you get allocated the time to do anything smarter. Uh, so like, hey, I look at how I'm getting events from Kafka to BigQuery. Fantastic. Oh, but I really need the events in slightly different format. So let's the next sprint, the next two weeks, I'm going to really uh, do, try to do something a bit more involved. Yep. And then once we know how to collect a lot of events into Kafka and write them into BigQuery, why stop with um, clicks, right? I mean, there is a lot of useful data in those legacy uh, data systems and in your application. Right. And you can use it, for example, maybe running a bank and you have your credit card processing, and you have transactions and you have loan requests and you have a lot of old information about the customers and legacy systems, bringing them all together uh, processing them, getting them to Google BigQuery with uh, things like uh, Connect or Google Dataflow, depending on the use case. And then you really have a lot of data here to process. Imagine trying to get access to the data on the legacy mainframe and the tools you'd have to use to do right. it. Uh, like just how long the process would take versus doing experimentation in mm -hmm. data that shows up in real time. It's a very big difference in quality of life. And then if you want to get, like, if you've got the simple use cases working, you can do some things that are more advanced and obviously more exciting. I think it's more exciting. A lot of data these days comes from devices. Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, IoT has made my life easier, maybe a tad lazier. Everything, <laughs> all of my outlets are wired, and I just speak into my Google Home and turn on everything, turn off everything. You actually do that? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm not that advanced, but I do have uh, things like uh, Nest and those programmable light bulbs if I want to do set up a mood in my house. And uh, it's a lot of fun. So basically all of those devices speak very f small number of protocols. A common one is MQTT. And a part of uh, the Confluent platform is an MQTT proxy. So you can really collect information from those devices, stream it into the cloud. When the nice thing about clouds is there's probably a cloud center near a region nearby to, from where the device is. And then you can really start doing advanced things like you can train a model. And using the same data, 
You can also serve the model mm -hmm. in real time, something like Google Functions serving up the model on every event as it happens. So you can really start with something fairly pedestrian, like clickstream processing, and end up with a real-time machine learning IoT system that is probably something that you can raise some money with. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so obviously, with all that, you want to actually use all those cool tools. You don't necessarily want to install them, configure them, figure out why they're losing data, or maybe they're not losing data, mm -hmm. and why they're not losing data, uh, why they're not losing data but doing it too, fa too slow or too fast, managing it, upgrading it, troubleshooting it, getting the pager at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a pager job? Uh, not, <laughs> not for a while, but I do remember getting those alerts in the middle Yeah, of the night. I'm just thinking, like, my last pager job was maybe in 2009, and I do not miss that at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, basically, introducing the, or not introducing, it's been around for a while, but the idea is that if you could run it yourself, Kafka is open source, you can install and run it, or you can let us run it for you on the Google platform, and it's kind of, I'll show you, it's kind of integrated with the rest of the Google platform, with right. those connectors, so. Yeah, one thing I always tell users, developers, you know, when you're building your application, if it's not something that is core to your, your project, if it's something that you need, but it, managing it doesn't really add value, it's always best to have somebody else manage it. That way you can focus all your time, resources, energies onto the things that actually matter for your application, totally. for your business. And the really funny thing is that I've been working with the same companies for a bunch of years now. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how like companies that three years ago were like, we are never going to use cloud. <laughs> Clouds will not work for our banking system. And then three years later, like, oh, we are, you know, we're actually starting to move to the cloud. We could use some help. How, what's a good architecture for migrating to the cloud? Mm -hmm. What's a good use case? How do we do cloud security? And I think it's in just the economics of it are kind of inevitable. Why would you want to run your own data center if it's not your competency? Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it just doesn't make sense to do it if it, doesn't, if it doesn't benefit your application at the end of the day. Exactly. Focus on things you're actually good at, in banking case, taking your money. <laughs> All right. Let's look at Confluent Cloud then. Yes. Let me try to switch to my demo. Okay, so I'm already logged into the Confluent Cloud, and you can see that I basically have a bunch of clusters already here. If I want to add a new one, it's really not a big deal. So let's say I want to test something new, and you can see I can kind of play around with how much data I'm consuming and producing. The important bit is to select the right provider, right region, and how many availability zones, and then we click continue. Uh, look, this is going to cost us uh, half a dollar per hour, and we're here for an hour, so uh, you, I think you better pay up. All right, I'll send it to you over Google Pay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so after I launch the cluster, I basically see a bunch of instructions on how to install uh, CCloud which is based on, inspired by G-Cloud, which we all know and love. And this allows me to um, basically use the cloud from the command line. So, yeah. Basically, I can do something like C-Cloud topics list. And because I'm already connected to one of my clusters, you can see I have a pretty big list of topics going on here. I wish they sorted them. It's kind of not really sorted. I can create a new topic, basically kind of a new topic. Uh, I can produce events into a topic if I want to. So you want me to show you how I produce events sure, into a topic? Sure, let's do that. So this was the new topic I created. Okay, so I produced an event, super simple. And now I want to obviously consume it. And I'm doing minus B so it will start consuming from the beginning, otherwise mm -hmm. you only get new events and you'll sit there staring for a long time. Why is nothing showing up? So this does take a bit of time because we need to negotiate the consumer group and right. see if someone else connects, but 
Soon enough, there it is. here is a low. So hey, if you're following at home, this may be the first event you produce and consume. Uh, I know, and for me, when I teach classes, it's always exciting to see yes. people produce and consume their first event. But what I really wanted to show you is how I build a pipeline. So okay. how I get events from Wikipedia, um, maybe run a SQL pre-query, and then write them to BigQuery. Mm -hmm. And we, you, you can show me how to do a query on BigQuery. <laughs> Okay, so I'm switching to a Confluent Control Center, and and basically you can see all the topics here, but I really wanted to show you the connectors. So you can see that I have a Wikipedia connector, and I already explained that connectors, they don't require you to write code, you basically configure them. So over here, I basically configured the Wikipedia server. It's an RC server, Wikipedia publishes all everything that happens to a bunch of uh, channels. So, and you can see all the channels that I'm reading from. It's basically a channel for every language. And I'm writing all of them to the same Wikipedia topic. So let me start that. And then let's go and see, look at the data. So I'm looking for the Wikipedia topic. When I click here, you can see that I have a bunch of screens. So I can see the schema in the topic. And I can take a look. You can see this is real-time events. You can see more events are coming yep. in, and I can see the new events. And uh, so and you can actually see the data. So we're common Wikipedia, and this user edited this page. You put in this message. I find it pretty cool. Yeah. Now, if I want to actually run a query, I can go to, oh, it's unable to connect. I cannot run queries for you. I'm sorry. It's all right. Yeah, Let's so, see what else we can do here. Yeah, that's how what happens on the things that you didn't test the night before, right? Mm, we've Pretty all much been there. That, yeah, that's how demos work. Uh, but I can um, go to the sync and basically say, so Wikipedia edits will not exist because that's the one with the things that uh, who were supposed to get processed. But Wikipedia, we can still get Wikipedia events into um, BigQuery. So we edit here, and here you can see that I'm getting events from those two topics. And I'm basically uh, mapping them. So Wikipedia edits go to Wikipedia edits. Wikipedia goes to Wikipedia. So that's basically a topic to table mapping for a BigQuery. And you can see this is my BigQuery project. And this is the, the name of the data set is Wikipedia. It took me a long time to figure out how the, all this terminology mm -hmm. works. But it's the same terminology. If you know BigQuery, it will probably be a lot easier for you than it was for me. I figured out how to use the... A JSON key file to actually authorize my uh, BigQuery user. And so now, after I figure this all out, I can start my connector. And I think let's go to the. I don't know how to switch tabs, so it's going to be the hard way. Right. Yeah, so this is my uh, Google uh, dashboard. And here I have BigQuery. You can see that I have a data set. And the da I have to create a data set. But so before I start the connector, I had to create the Wikipedia data set. But the tables will basically be automatically created based on the mapping. And their schema will be automatically created based mm -hmm. on the schema of the events in Kafka that I kind of showed you. And if I make a change to the events in Kafka, if I could use KSQL to actually edit the events, it will, the change will automatically reflect in BigQuery. So that's pretty cool. Uh, oh, it actually shows me all my query history. I didn't know it does that. That's neat. So I can actually as well can do something like, all, you can see all of those were on Wikipedia edits. But I want to do something from, does it do autocomplete? Pedia source. Can you talk to your product manager? I want autocomplete. We'll put it on the list. <laughs> and let's get just like a few of those. What am I missing? If I click here, it will just uh, run the query for me. Query table, yeah. Oh, I needed to have like the fully qualified uh, type yep. name. Running the query, oh. That's all right. Probably we don't have results from today yet. Or? No, it's still new. That's all right though. Yeah, that's let's a risk Let's look at all of them, yeah. We've all been there. Yeah. Exactly. So um, you can see here basically the Wikipedia pages. You can see the channels. 
I can also show you, since I think I still have all data with, from the Wikipedia edits, I can probably show you how I enriched it with KSQL back when KSQL still worked for me. Um, I want to get rid of the uh, partition. Yes, probably. And then give an asterisk too. Yeah, I really like how it shows the errors that they have. That's super helpful. Yeah, and now it's going to work. See, it parses everything in real time. That's Real time just adds a lot more usability to pretty much everything. So you can see here that I added a readable uh, date. So now you know that I did all my practice five days ago. And if you go to the end, you can see that I added the language. And the mm -hmm. way I added the language is that it's based, see that the channel name is like fr.wikipedia. Right. I basically joined it with a table that I created that has a mapping of the channel to the language. Okay. And then I could do a join and get. Awesome. Yeah, that is pretty awesome. So basically, this allows us to get events from um, Wikipedia to uh, Kafka, if we are lucky, even do some stream processing, and then use Connect to write the events to uh, BigQuery. Right. And all that in real time. So and this is just one of the many ways we can use Kafka in Confluent Cloud. Exactly. Yes. And the next next time I'll try to demo TensorFlow. Of course. <laughs> With That'll a small a IoT, IoT device that kind of drives around here. Exactly. <laughs> well, great. Yeah, so just in case people want to try it. Huh. Yeah, here we are. Um, Basically, we have a Confluent Cloud Professional, which is exactly the UI that I showed you. So you can just, you write uh, confluent.cloud, or you click on that, you go to that URL, and you basically sign up, and you say it's like half a dollar per hour, so, and building this pipeline takes just, I don't know, an hour, and um, right. you can, it's basically something that you can get started with fairly easily. Okay. All right, well, that was great. Uh, stay tuned for a live Q&A. We will come back in about a minute, and we will answer your questions about Confluent Cloud and Kafka. Can't wait. Welcome back. Looks like we've got some really good questions. So why don't we jump right into them? How secure is data in Confluent Cloud? What measures do you have in place to protect data? Isn't it the first thing that everyone always asks about the cloud? Yes, <laughs> how everybody. Do, how is... do you keep our data safe? Yeah, so Kafka itself has basically the authorization, authentication, encryption, the things you need to keep safe. In Confluent Cloud, by default, all the communication is SSL encrypted, so you have encryption on the wire. We use encrypted storage to store the data, so you have encryption on disk. Uh, you authorize with, basically you get an API key and a secret, as long as you keep them safe, we don't even know them. And uh, basically that's the authentication uh, method. Um, if you are a bit even more paranoid than that, and you don't, if, a lot of people, I mean, in this case, I exposed my Kafka to the world. Like, I could just use it from my laptop, from the Google uh, mm -hmm. Wi-Fi with no issues. But if you 
want to limit the access to just within your own data center and just within your company VPN, then we also support VPC peering. So you can use this to uh, have an even more secure experience. To be honest, like, I'm exposing my toy clusters to the internet, but I wouldn't probably do it if it was actually running my bank. Right. <laughs> and then being hosted on Google Cloud, you guys, you get to have the added benefit of the security that Google Cloud offers. Yeah. So. For example, your load balancer is probably what keeps us safe from DDoS attacks. So. Exactly. <laughs> we currently have some applications running in our data center. But we would also like to use BigQuery in real time with data generated by our on-premises applications. Is this possible with Kafka? I think I just showed that it is, right? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to get data from Wikipedia. <laughs> it was a cute demo, but um, you can really get the data from anything that you produce to Kafka on yeah. Google Cloud. You can use Connect and the BigQuery connector to get the data to uh, Google BigQuery. If you don't want to use the BigQuery mm -hmm. connector, you can also use Dataflow or Kafka Streams or something batchy or code that you wrote yourself because you are a not invented here person. The sky is the limit. Right, with that REST API, mm -hmm. you're able to write a lot. So. Yeah. We have implemented Kafka ourselves and have been running it for three years now. As, a Kaf as Kafka adoption increased, we are experiencing some issues. It is lagging quite a bit, and this is impacting our business. Do you have any recommendations on what we should look into? Oh, oh that is a pretty, uh, tuning is a big topic. So I'm going to assume that you're running on Confluent Cloud, and obviously the brokers are running perfectly well. So it's really more about looking into your uh, consumers, like your application, why is it lagging? So first of all, kudos for noticing that your application is lagging. Mm -hmm. We've seen people who do not monitor consumer lag and therefore don't even know that their application is lagging. So if you're monitoring it and you know it's lagging, you're already a step ahead of everyone else. And then if you look, most the lag monitoring tools, definitely in control center, but I think also the rest of them, they will basically show you how, what the lag looks like. Is it increasing, decreasing? You fell behind and you cannot catch up. It will mm -hmm. also show you how many partitions you have, how many consumers you have, and the lag on each partition. So you can say, oh, actually this consumer is reading from five partitions, while the other two consumers are barely reading from two partitions, and we need to uh, somehow reassign partitions and rebalance because it's clear why this one is falling behind. Mm -hmm. You can say, oh, it's one consumer, 100 partitions, Lots of data gets written. It may have been okay 10 right. years ago, maybe not okay now. And then sometimes you also have a problem where one partition just gets more data. And you need to consider your, the keys that you're writing. How do you really um, distribute the events to partitions to avoid this kind of skew? Because it can also cause you to lag. If you're running Kafka yourself, obviously there is a lot of issues that can happen. It can be that a broker is handling a lot more work than the rest and you need to rebalance. It can be that you have a bad disk for that matter. Like, it can be a lot of different things. <laughs> Great. Well, that, that helps uh, narrow it down a little bit, though. <laughs> at least so. a tiny bit. That's the nice thing about not running the broker yourself. At least you know that this part, you can figure it out with a call to support and then you only have to worry about the rest. Exactly. <laughs> We are a cloud native company and are looking for Kafka as a service. What are some things we should consider when selecting a particular service? Good question. We have a lot of people <laughs> nowadays that are born in the cloud. Their applications never saw an on-premise data center. Yeah, so, I mean, for me, I'm a very much open source person. Mm -hmm. I think you should try to avoid lock-in mm -hmm. and try to make sure you're using open source software, open standards. Um, just uh, look at the community and make sure that we're, you're working with the communities mm -hmm. that you enjoy working with. Uh, you obviously want to make sure that the people running the software are actually capable of supporting it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess it is, but this is just due diligence. And then, um, trying to think, do you have suggestions? Uh, Testimonials is always a good thing. Whenever yeah. I'm looking for somebody, I try to find <laughs> who somebody else who else it? has used it, what they use, how they felt about it. Yeah. Uh, it's important to, uh, to emphasize, though, that Confluent has a lot of the original designers, creators of Kafka. So yeah. that's one way. To, that's that's well, a little bit of a selling point there. The other thing is that as just as a developer, you want to work with nice tools. Mm -hmm. I think the reason that I enjoy uh, Google Cloud and really something we try to emulate in Confluent Cloud 
is really have a nice command line, mm -hmm. uh, APIs that are usable. Just make, make sure that it's a good, you're going to spend a lot of time in that environment if you're a developer. So it has to be a nice environment. Okay. Final question. We are heavily invested in GCP and are adopting Kafka. Is Confluent Kafka uh, the same as GCP Kafka? Is it a native GCP service? Well, I can answer the GCP part. Today, we do not have a managed Kafka, but we have a partnership with Confluent to provide you managed Kafka on GCP. Yeah, so the big difference, I guess, is that if it's not a native GCP service, you don't get to see it on the big Google dashboard where right. I saw BigQuery, for example. Uh, but other than that, we are running on the GCP infrastructure. Right. Think specifically on GKE, we're using all the available G Google tooling. Um, right. So yeah, it is not a GCP Kafka, but hopefully you kind of get a GCP experience that you know and love. <laughs> right, and running Confluent Cloud on GCP is just, you know, you can integrate with every other GCP tool, like we saw BigQuery earlier, maybe it's a, a cloud machine learning engine, a cloud functions, app engine, pretty much anything you see on GCP. Yeah, so. I mean, I haven't shown that, but I'm actually running a Kafka Streams job running on Google um, Kuber GKE, so the Google Kubernetes right. Engine, and that connects to my uh, Confluent Cloud, and another way to integrate your apps with uh, the whole Google ecosystem. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I think that's all the questions we have for today. So I'd like to thank you, Gwen, for coming out. and Thank you so much for inviting me. Sharing with the world everything about Kafka and Confluent Cloud and how it could take your events to the next level and the events that your apps generate and your devices, those smart switches and cameras and everything. And keep everything real time. Exactly. So stay tuned for the next session. Add rich geospatial analysis to your toolbox with BigQuery GIS. Thank you very much. It's See all about time. BigQuery. You could get the GIS to uh, BigQuery with Kafka and then do the geospatial exactly. analysis. There you go. <laughs>